it's a couple of minutes past. I think the en entrants are starting to slow down a little bit. So I think we'll, we'll kick off. Um, what I'll do is I'll hand over to our panelists. So I'll hand over to Alice to, to introduce herself and the rest of the panel, and then we'll we'll go straight into the webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, uh, hands our folks. Uh, my name's Alice Gibson. I am a disability training and consultancy specialist. What that means in reality is I deliver a lot of training, lots of health, well-being and mental health training. Uh, and I grew up in a really neurodiverse household, so I've got a particular interest in neurodiversity. Thanks, Alice. My name's Claire Flats. I'm the assessor team leader on the BBC Access and Disability Services contract. So I work um, predominantly with the BBC um, and head up the assessor team who provide on the ground support for um, BBC staff with um, pan disability. So, yeah, that's me. Over to you, Kath. <laughs> Hello, yes, I'm Kath Wood and I work in the same team as Alice and I lead on products and services. Um, so a lot of the neurodiversity training and the neurodiversity toolkit has been uh, part of the projects I've been working on. So welcome to the session. So the aim of today's session is to develop your awareness of dyslexia and dyspraxia. Uh, we'll begin with some facts and figures about each condition before exploring strengths that they bring and potential challenges that people may face in the workplace. My colleague Alice will then take you through some simple workplace changes which could help a colleague who have these conditions. And my colleague Claire will then explain the benefits of workplace assessments and go through a case study of how it's helped somebody. And we'll end with some questions that you could use to help you to um, a colleague to succeed at work, to how to understand their dyslexia or dyspraxia. So dyspraxia and dyslexia are two of a number of conditions. Um, which come under the umbrella term of neurodiversity, along with a few like autism, ADHD, Erlen's, dyscalculia and Tourette's. So neurodiversity describes the different ways that brains develop and function. And it's a term that really highlights the different set of skills and abilities and ways of thinking that people have. These conditions were previously referred to as specific learning difficulties, which seem to emphasise what people can't do. So the term neurodiversity and diversity in particular is about recognising and valuing difference, which is why it's a term that's preferred by most people. Throughout this webinar, we'll be considering the strengths that are associated with these conditions, but also the potential difficulties, as it's only by understanding both that can even really help individuals to achieve their full potential. So we'll start today with dyslexia. It's estimated that around 10% of the population are affected by dyslexia to some extent, um, but some places even report this could figure could be as high as even 17%. It can be thought of as a continuum as people can be mildly, moderately or severely affected. And it's around 4% of the population that are severely affected or impacted by their dyslexia. Dyslexia is a difference in an individual's ability to learn and process information, which produces both strengths and challenges. It's not linked to intelligence, but it can make learning difficult, especially with traditional teaching methods. So as we said, dyslexia affects the way the brain works, and this creates the potential for a range of useful skills, especially in the modern workplace. Dyslexia is associated with being curious, inquisitive, imaginative, and creative. This can lead to strengths in many different areas of creativity, like being artistic, musical, or talented at sport. And it's also linked with being entrepreneurial and inspiring and leading others. People with dyslexia have an ability to be observant, focus on detail, analyze complex information and notice when things aren't right or things are out of place. That means they're great at troubleshooting, great at fault identifying, and it explains why security services have specifically employed dyslexic people to spot patterns in events or data or to crack codes and solve complex problems. People with dyslexia are able to see beyond detail to gain a strategic view of a subject or problem. Rather than looking at things in a sequence, they look at things simultaneously as a whole or in an alternative way which means they can identify interrelationships, similarities between ideas, see patterns in information or trends in data. Such strengths are really, really helpful and significant in fields like science, maths or industry. Selected people have the ability to learn through experiences, either real or imagined. They may also recall things as a story with information linking together rather than random sets of data. This episodic memory and narrative reasoning is what helps them to integrate contextual information much better. 
Many dyslexic people have an ability to visualize or create three-dimensional multi-sensory images of an issue, which allows their thoughts to evolve and grow as information is added. This visual thinking is thought to be much faster than verbal thinking. And research has shown that many people with dyslexia are much better at manipulating 3D objects in their minds, which lends itself to design, engineering, construction, and architecture. The dyslexic brain is set up for being analytical and logical, using the patterns or concepts they've identified to see a way through a problem, evaluating evidence, exploring possibilities, making balanced and then informed decisions. Dyslexics are usually good problem solvers, and this is developed when people have had to find different ways to learn or solve problems when traditional learning has been difficult for them or normal solutions have not been effective. So this includes finding out information from different sources, making different connections, visualizing potential outcomes and finding new ways to do things. Dyslexic people tend to show a high level of empathy for others. And this can come from two sources. First, their personal experiences of a struggle can give them an understanding of others who are also having difficulties. And secondly, there can be a level of intuition and been able to read a situation which allows them to understand what's happening from somebody else's point of view. But we're now gonna move on to look at the challenges that dyslexia may bring. We're covering potential challenges here, so don't assume that everybody experiences the same issues. The best way to understand the difficulties somebody with dyslexia is facing is to actually ask them. So dyslexia affects the way the person processes information. It's associated strongly with reading, writing and spelling issues, but there are a much wider range of effects too. It impacts the skills involved in accurate and fluent reading, writing and spelling, it involves difficulties in dealing with the sounds of words, so it's especially hard for people to use phonics to read words. It can affect your ability to recall or process a list of words or numbers, or to remember a list of instructions. People may have difficulty with elements of written work, such as making spelling or grammatical errors, having poor handwriting, finding it hard to structure the written communication, and really struggling to express their ideas fully in writing. You may notice for somebody with dyslexia, there's a huge contrast between how they express their ideas verbally and actually what they put down on paper. They're also likely to experience some reading issues, such as difficulty reading fluently, maybe a reluctance to read aloud. They might struggle to understand and learn new words or misread words. And some people have a visual sensitivity to text where the words seem to move or blow on the page. A less than known effect of dyslexia is the difficulty it causes in processing and memory. So there may be short term and working memory problems, which can mean it takes longer for somebody to learn things, especially with the traditional way that things are taught or trained. And it may not be straightforward for people to apply rules to different situations. People may need extra time to process information, to respond to questions or to express themselves fully. And they might have trouble with verbal instructions. Many dyslexic people can also struggle with organisation, time and planning, which can lead to difficulty with sequences of tasks or following instructions. People may seem really unprepared for meetings and events because they haven't been able to order their thoughts and they may uh, work in a disorganised work area or lose things. Dyslexia can make planning, prioritising and multitasking more difficult. People may struggle to meet deadlines, especially with a long project or if it's a range of complex tasks which have not been broken down into manageable chunks. They may also have some directional difficulties such as navigation, a tendency to get lost, or even mixing up their left and their rights. So now let's move on to dyspraxia, which some people may know as Developmental Coordination Disorder, or DCD. It affects motor coordination and is thought to be caused by a disruption in the way that messages from the brain are transmitted to the body. This affects a person's ability to perform movements in a smooth and coordinated way. Some with dyspraxia may also have associated difficulties with speech, language, perception, and thought. It's thought to around, affect around 6% of the population and around 2% of the population are severely impacted by the dyspraxia. Again, it occurs across all intelligences uh, and you can see this is a similar percentage to dyslexia, but much less well known. So dyspraxia affects fine and gross motor skills, but it's distinctly different from other mobility difficulties, such as cerebral palsy and a stroke. You don't grow out of dyspraxia. Years ago, it was known as clumsy child syndrome, suggesting it only affects children and will go away as it gets older. But this is not the case. The effects of dyspraxia remain the same as you get older, but people tend to learn how to manage their difficulties better over time. 
So as we saw with dyslexia, the different way the dyspraxic brain works creates challenges, which we'll come to next, but it also provides alternative ways of thinking, leading to a range of strengths, such as creativity, excellent imagination and original thinking, good strategic and holistic thinking, being analytical and observant with an eye for detail, good problem solving abilities, providing those alternative and integer solutions that the rest of the team hasn't come up with. Often distracts the people are visual thinkers again and explainers, and they're able to identify patterns and links and interrelationships. After managing the challenges dyspraxia can present, many people with dyspraxia develop highly valued personal characteristics, such as thoroughness and being methodical, being determined, resilient and motivated, being open-minded, considerate, patient and empathetic. So as we said, dyspraxia can affect all elements of coordination between the brain and body, and that presents a number of challenges. It can affect mind, fine motor skills, such as grip and dexterity, sometimes making writing or operating machinery more difficult. It can also affect gross motor skills, our balance and our body awareness, which means that people may have an unusual gait, tend to bump into things or drop things more often, hence the clumsy child syndrome. Speech and language can be impacted. Difficulties may present a slow reading, misreading or misunderstanding information, pronunciation issues, finding copying and proofreading hard. There may also be problems with visual perception, such as difficulty focusing on information or having blurred vision. Some dyspraxic people have heightened sensitivity to light, temperature, sound, or even touch. Dyspraxia can also affect concentration and memory, which can make it difficult for people to maintain attention and focus, especially when there are distractions and interruptions. There could be some difficulty with multitasking, or returning to a task after an interruption or a break. It can also be a knock-on effect on somebody's ability to stay on track with work and some people experience excessive tiredness. Organisational skills can be affected, such as difficulty in planning, prioritising and meeting deadlines. Their work area may seem to be disorganised and again they could be prone to forgetting or losing things or missing appointments unless strategies are put in place. And some people can have a tendency to get lost when travelling. All of these issues mean that for some people, communication and social situations can be difficult, particularly when required to respond quickly. This can lead to confidence and self-esteem issues shown by avoiding those social situations or doubting their abilities, especially in work, or being concerned about new activities and change. We're now going to briefly cover some related conditions to dyspraxia and dyslexia. Mears Erlen syndrome, known as visual stress, or scotopic sensitivity syndrome, or just Erlen's. It involves visual perception or eye problems caused by the way that the brain interprets, interprets the visual information that's sent from the eyes. So it can make reading difficult, um, and people may also perceive their, their environment differently too. So it's thought that around 20% of us are affected to some degree by this visual stretch. So this could this could be related to some of the other learning difficulties or neurodiverse conditions. So some data suggests that around half of dyslexic people, around um, a third of those with ADHD may also have Erlen's. It's also thought that it may be part of the sensory overload or distortion that people with autism experience. Dyscalculia affects a person's ability to understand or record and use numerical information. So people may feel anxious when they're having to do math related tasks and they may avoid situations where they have to do this, such as paying bills or avoiding certain jobs with maths involved. This also affects the way that numerical information is processed, which means that people can also have difficulty with memory, speed of thinking, organization and secrecy. And finally, dysgraphia. It's a neurological condition that affects a combination of motor and information processing skills and this is that are used in writing, and it can co-occur with conditions such as dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dyspraxia. Those with dysgraphia have difficulty in both the physical aspect of writing and the thought processes that are associated with putting things or expressing things in writing. Most people with dysgraphia are able to write, but it requires a lot of concentration and effort, and the results may be hard for us to read. So I'm now gonna pass you over to my colleague, Alice, who's gonna have a look at the changes that we can make in the workplace to make it easier for those colleagues who have these conditions. Thanks, Kath. 
Um, so exactly. So we need to now look at the things that are generally going to make it easier for the colleagues and the people that we work with, with dyslexia and um, dyspraxia or any of the other conditions that we've mentioned. Um, so that it's likely that some people will have difficulty with um, reading or writing. So there are some simple adjustments that you can make that would reduce the difficulty that they may be having. So here are just a few. We can try and give information in other ways. And so verbally, we can use flowcharts, diagrams, even pictures in documents. And um, we can also highlight key points or give summaries um, to make sure um, we allow plenty of time uh, for people to read and complete the task. Um, it can also help to go through any written materials beforehand so um, or even after a meeting or a training session. And ideally, you shouldn't ask uh, anyone to read or write in front of other people and it's going to put them on the spot. Now, it could be beneficial to um, offer help with any handwritten work so we can help with proofreading or actually finding other options for recording information. So taking a picture or even using a dictaphone. So supplying a dictionary as well, a spell checker, or even a glossary of terms can help. Um, and it's worth discussing technology, things like speech to text, um, any software like that can help and be of an advantage. So if you or your colleagues are producing any written material, um, it can be made more accessible in the following ways. So we can offer um, coloured or even off-white paper. We can use dark coloured text on a light paper, but not white uh, background. And we should avoid using red or green text or pens. Uh, we can use plain, evenly spaced um, rounded font that's at least size 12 to 14. So I know we all hate Comic Sans, but Comic Sans is a perfect example um, of text that would be appropriate. Um, avoid using capital letters um, and underlines and italics. We can emphasize things by using bold um, or a larger font. We make text, you know, left justified and full width um, and making sure that the line spacing is at least 1.5. It makes it a lot easier to read. We can use bullet points and numbering um, rather than continuous text and essays. We can also use short and simple sentences, you know, being concise and direct. Um, we can give instructions clearly, you know, a list of, of do's and don'ts are recommended, for example. It's a lot easier to follow. Um, and using the active rather than passive voice um, and avoiding double negatives. We could put flowcharts together, pictograms, put graphics into documents to break it up um, and also avoid using abbreviations and jargon, which I know we are all guilty of. OK. Um, now, if organisation and processing are an issue, then there are lots of things that we can do to help, um, such as using diaries, planners, uh, alarms, alerts, checklists, that sort of thing. Um, using filing systems and colour coding can make things easier. Uh, some people may benefit from um, planning an organisation time at the start and end of every day or every shift um, or breaking tasks down into smaller, more manageable steps. Some people might need assistance with prioritising tasks as uh, so setting deadlines. Some people might need extra time for certain tasks. Um, we can minimise sources of distraction and interruption. So someone being able to use a quieter space can help too. Um, examples and templates as well can be really useful, um, you know, as can those regular and additional breaks, again, to break things up a little. Um, and note taking and mind mapping um, can help people organize their thoughts and ultimately retain key information. Um, now, if someone has uh, processing or memory issues, then they can find training particularly difficult and they might also struggle to keep track of their, their work or a certain task. So they might benefit from training in alternative ways or shorter sessions rather than full days. And a one to one meeting after a training session or a group meeting can help consolidate learning and potentially identify uh, any gaps or any needs. Um, as well, giving material in advance of training and meetings, it gives people a foundation to build on and removes an element of anxiety. Uh, distractions and interruptions should be minimized at all costs and using that quiet space again can be beneficial. 
check understanding of, of key tasks and key information, um, you know, providing examples and templates, for example, um, again, is going to ensure that people um, understand fully what is expected of them. Um, and once again, those regular or additional breaks can help. People will benefit from um, the, the note taking and the mind mapping. It's, it's all about retaining that information. OK, um, and the environment that we work in can be easily adjusted um, and we can make it more suitable to productive working. Um, if someone has sensory issues um, or issues with balance. So, for example, the the first step is to check the actual environment, make sure it's suitable. We can look at the lighting, the ventilation and um, temperature, even noise levels, because you can minimize noise um, by adding soft furnishings um, because that's going to minimize an echo. Um, and if it's not possible, you know, we can provide that access to a quiet space or even noise cancelling headphones because they can they can mitigate any issues and they're they're not particularly expensive. Um, it is important to remove unnecessary clutter. Um, so leaflets, posters, um, anything that is, you know, brightly coloured or has lots of patterns on it because we're trying to reduce the distraction. And it's a good idea to ensure that there is actually sufficient space in the work environment to allow for free movement um, and clear routes to exits and toilets and staff areas. Um, we need to make sure that they're kept clear at all times. Um, and of course, trip hazards, you know, they should always be be removed, um, but it's even more so important if someone has balance or uh, or movement issues. So as we discussed earlier, dyslexia um, and dyspraxia or, or other conditions might affect someone socially or, or even emotionally, too. So someone might benefit from support to prepare for reviews or appraisals um, or having you know, a, a meeting before any group activity to check how they're feeling and to discuss any uh, reasonable adjustments that are needed. Positive feedback can be helpful as well, um, as can setting these smaller and achievable goals because it's going to help build that level of confidence. Uh, a workplace mentor or a workplace buddy might help. Um, and actually, the person might want their, their team to have greater awareness, too. So to support with, with any other communication challenges, it can be massively helpful to set out the aims of, of any meeting right at the beginning um, or even issuing an agenda in advance. Now, in both formal and informal conversations, it's beneficial to allow people um, time to process questions and give answers. And if you are giving information verbally, then do it in bite sized chunks. You can recap, you can summarize, you can check understanding regularly. Um, and if you can back up any verbal instructions with written notes or emails, then that's going to be uh, massively beneficial to the person. Um, so I'm going to be passing over to, to Claire now. Hi there, thank you very much. So um, as part, working as part of the workplace assessment programme, we carry out assessments for um, a very wide range of different employers. So our workplace assessments um, have the aim of identifying disability related barriers for individuals within their job role. So ideally, we're looking at um, helping them to fulfil their job role with the appropriate support. So our approach will support organisation and managers with managing and retaining talent. So as was mentioned earlier, we find a lot of people have different abilities and when they're being taught under the usual processes, they quite often um, can't achieve what they're what they're capable of. Um, so diversity and inclusion. So ensuring that um, the workforce has a full range of um, a diverse um, workforce and also risk management as well to avoid any um, potential risks around um, employing the, anyone with the disability. Um, so our expert holistic assessments are carried out by um, certified disability management professionals. So we all have um, that qualification. And so our role is to go in and identify the barriers that an individual is encountering. 
and hopefully make suggestions to overcome those barriers. Um, once we've agreed on the set um, outcome of it, we provide non-clinical case management. So that's to ensure that all of the adjustments are implemented at the end of the day. Um, so all of the um, points that Alice has just gone over would be the types of things that we look at, um, at recommending and then ensuring that they're implemented at the end of the day. We also um, provide management around the um, procurement and funding of those adjustments. So some of them are soft adjustments that are easily implemented at employee employer level. So they can be um, just incorporated into um, the team. Whereas there are some funded adjustments, so um, training, coaching, um, specialist software. Um, and so we know where we can go for funding of said items. Um, so we also provide um, expert advice and guidance and support for individuals, their line managers, and also HR. So where there's a particular issue um, around performance or something, um, where there's a disability included in it, that's where we step in and, and manage that process with them. Um, and then we also produce um, management statistics to ensure that we're um, meeting our contracted terms and conditions. <laughs> so next slide, please. So we'll just, um, I'll just explain, do a bit of a case study. So this particular case um, has been known to the service for quite some, a few years. Um, when they first um, approached our service, they were um, an apprentice. So entry level role, just coming into the employer um, and they reported that they had a diagnosis as a child of dyslexia um, and they prov they were provided with um, quite basic level support throughout school. So that was um, reading support in class um, and also um, additional help when they got on to secondary school with um, studying. When they commenced university, um, they were re-diagnosed to get support or, or they underwent another assessment, um, which confirmed the diagnosis of dyslexia, but also highlighted the presence of dyspraxia. Um, they had traits common with that of dyspraxia. So um, they reported um, specifically issues with organisation and time management, but the traits that they highlighted were around sensory sensitivity, um, procrastination, and also um, being able to produce um, written work with um, meaning. Um, so they, they they termed it as waffling. <laughs> so, um, so when they were actually in their role, commencing their role, um, we it was reported that they'd had issues um, maintaining the learning pace with the apprenticeship. So obviously there's a, a, a date, a finite date where you have to achieve your apprenticeship. So um, it was also identified that they were quite often running late, which is one of the classic symptoms that, or traits of um, dyspraxia. Um, and it was identified that there was a need for ongoing support. So this was all established in the first assessment. So the support that we put in place was assistive technology. So they had um, Dragon software, which is the um, speech to text. So they could verbalize their thoughts, which um, helped them produce documentation much quicker because they had really good verbal ability, but they struggled with the um, typing process. Then we also looked at reading support in terms of um, text to speech software. So that's where it reads the screen for you. So it just helped help them with comprehension. Um, so just having the screen read to them. Um, we also looked at a note taking device, which is, um, it, it's called a LiveScribe smart pen. So what it does is it records audio of a meeting and it links up with notes on a paper so it looks like a normal notepad but you have the audio recording of it 
So the individual was then able to attend meetings um, and training and just make really brief notes and then go back to that part of the recording um, once they needed to access it after the training session, for example. Um, they also had strategy coaching. Now, this is quite commonly recommended um, and it's um, increasing in um interest <laughs> over recent years so um, the individual works with um, a neurodivergent specialist and they help them establish job specific coping strategies so anything any barriers that the individual's having in doing their job role they can work with their strategy coach to help them establish those um, work related strategies to overcome their barriers so with all of those adjustments, um, there were also soft adjustments recommended as well. So things like um, weekly wrap meetings with a line manager, a buddy. Um, I don't know. There was something else as well. Um, oh, um, a working with me document. So these, they, they were soft adjustments that we also suggested would be helpful. So then all of that worked out well. The individual... Um, passed their apprenticeship and they moved into a substantive role within the employer and um, with the increased responsibilities of their new substantive role they felt that their support needs had increased again so um, we carried out a reassessment recently and put in more strategy coaching to address those changes um, but otherwise the the barriers that were reported originally and then the new barriers that were then reported on the re-referral have all been overcome and the individual you know reports to be successfully fulfilling their job role so um funding side of things so part of our process as i mentioned earlier is around procurement and funding so we approach the bbc um, not the bbc sorry we approach the government funding scheme called access to work um, who provide costed adjustments for people with disabilities so um we approach them get the funding in place and then um we manage that whole process um so we know what's available um there are certain um, restrictions on funding. So if, if it's not available, then we would approach the employer to, to cover the difference. Um, but again, that's part of our overall process around ensuring that individuals get the support that they need. So I think that's, um, that's everything for the work case study. Okay. So uh, final five things to leave you with, really, because I said earlier, earlier, all the way through the webinar, we've been focused very much on generic, general sort of um, descriptions of the conditions, strengths and challenges. And actually, there's so many different ways that these traits are presenting for people. There's also many, many different types of work that people will be doing. So actually, in order to be able to support somebody in the workplace, you have to understand their presentation of their symptoms and traits but also um, how it impacts on the job they're doing. So really, really important to think about these five questions. Um, so how does your condition affect you at work? How can we make the most of your skills and strengths? What challenges do you experience at work? What changes to the way we work could really help you? And what do you want others to know about you and your condition? So using the foundation knowledge that we've covered in the session today, and these questions, you should be able to draw out the important information that you need to be able to support your colleagues. Um, so I can see already we've got quite a few questions uh, already in the Q&A. So back to you, Nicole, to sift your way through the questions and we'll try and yes. answer them if we can. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to the panel. That's incredibly interesting. Um, I, I learned a lot there too. So thank you. And we have had loads of questions. So thank you so much to our audience for asking. We've had a uh, a lot of questions about the toolkits. What I will do is um, the toolkits are a commercial product of ours. They're fantastic, actually. Um, and what I will do when we send the recording out via email, we'll also send a link to our brochure, which includes all of the information about that. If you want somebody, I know some of you have dropped in um, your email addresses for some direct contact, which we will, I'll get one of my colleagues, uh, a lady, a lovely lady called Lee Paul, who will follow up with you directly about those as well. So we've had loads of questions. So I'm just going to try and, and run through as many as I can. 
Um, a, quite a lot of questions, actually. I think I, I'm just trying to think whom this might be the best for, actually, uh, whether it's perhaps Kath and Claire, about the the text to speech, the speech to text software, what other alternatives there are? A lot of people have heard of Dragon, it's quite expensive. And so people are just <laughs> interested in in other options that are out there and, and how they may go about accessing that. Okay, shall I field that one, Kath? Is that okay? Defer to your expertise, Claire, yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, so Dragon is commonly recommended for commercial use. So within businesses, obviously, um, the employer may have a site license. Um, there is a cheaper version for home use, um, which is, um, I'm, I'm not even sure how much, so I won't even guess. But um, technology has come on a long way in recent years. And so we all have available to us the um, inbuilt um accessibility functions on Macs and compute and Microsoft computers nowadays. So um, you can find it on um, on any Microsoft um, application. Um, I think it's Windows 10 and above. So if you have that, there's the um, read aloud, which will read back to you. And then there's also the um, I can't think what it's called now. Just let me, <laughs> but they're available to you. And Mac has always been very good. Apple have always been very good at um, their accessibility. Um, so that's all ready available on your computer if you've got a reasonably recent modern one. <laughs> yeah, and I Thank think you, Claire. the only thing I would add to that, Claire, is that smartphones um, yes. are fantastic. <laughs> So from a point of view, you don't need a dictaphone anymore because your phone will record, you know, there's that you can yeah. use a yeah. Siri type automated voice or Alexa to ask things. So, you know, utilizing all of those um, fantastic um, elements of our smartphones can actually resolve a lot of workplace issues as well um, mm -hmm. and also make it easier to plan and organize and track things. So it's utilizing the existing resources that you have um, rather mm -hmm. than just relying on, on that specialist software. I think there's lots of things you can do. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, a few people have asked this, in particular, Danny. Uh, I'll, I'll read out Danny's. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, but a, a few people have asked very similar sort of theme. How does the panel suggest that we approach a person that may exhibit some of these traits, but is perhaps undiagnosed? It's challenging and we clearly don't want to start labelling individuals, but equally, we know that many conditions do go undiagnosed. So have you got any sort of suggestions on on how to approach a, a colleague or employee if it's okay I'll, I'll take a first stab at it I'm not necessarily going to give you specific advice for the individual concerned but what I would say in general is um, the support that we offer doesn't have to depend on a diagnosis um, so actually if you're being individually responsive and you're looking at the challenges or the way that people are presenting in the workplace maybe some of the the things that they're coming to you with with issues around is actually work on resolving those rather than um, going just for the diagnosis. So the toolkit that I talked about earlier is we, we focus on traits and challenges rather than diagnosed conditions, because it's not everybody who is neurodivergent has a diagnosis or will ever get a diagnosis. So it could be presenting with a variety of traits. So my would say is my focus would be on trying to solve the workplace issues rather than, and then through that, you may identify certain traits would then suggest and hopefully the person will see that going for some sort of assessment will be helpful. But that assessment, again, doesn't necessarily have to be a diagnostic. It could be one of the workplace assessments that Claire's talked about. Fantastic. Thanks, Kath. Uh, quite a few questions about access to work. So quite a lot of people have tried this and are saying there's quite a long waiting time. With regards to <laughs> our, our um, services, a few people are asking is how does it differ and also are we saying that we can help someone with their access to work application or do we apply for them have we got a way of navigating the current waiting time quite a few people have, have mentioned about the waiting time at the moment um so access to work is the bane of my life at the moment <laughs> so it's okay i'll feel this one yeah so we're currently um around a 12-week wait for um cases to be picked up from application date um, that's been in place for about coming up for four years since COVID kicked off. So um, we we do get some employers to look at um, funding the adjustments on an interim basis 
Um, so they're happy to, if they're happy to accept the risk that access to work may not fund, then we can progress with ordering in the adjustments and then retrospectively, retrospectively claim once the funding is awarded. Um, we do have to ensure that the application has been made because they will only fund back to the date of the application. Um, but anything before that, they they just do not fund retrospectively. So, um, yeah, we're, we're getting through um, quite well at the moment on interim funding. But unfortunately, there isn't anything um, that you can do to speed it up. Um, what I will say, though, is if anybody does have a new starter um, who has declared a disability through the um, uh, application and interview stages, um, if you ensure that they initiate their application before their start date, they will get fast tracked so oh, wow. um, so that it will get picked up straight away. So that's just a, a little note in case anyone does have a new starter and you want to ensure that you've got their adjustments in for day one. OK. Fantastic. The Thank you, Claire. Say, if you, If you listen to almost all of Alice's section, most of that does not require access to work to fund it. Yeah. So though it is really helpful for the bigger purchases of the assistive technology, um, or maybe strategy coaching, there's a huge amount of things that you can do in the workplace that don't require that external funding. So it's worth exploring perhaps some of that um, sort of lower tech um, alternatives in the meantime. Soft as well. adjustments. That's, yeah, <laughs> soft adjustments, yeah. yeah. That doesn't even cost any money at all. It's just planning and yeah. being tactical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Another uh, theme, key thing that's coming through is about diagnosis. So uh, obviously with some of the conditions and some of the aspects of the conditions that have been discussed, people are asking that lots, these could be caused by lots of things. Is it, can you talk us through a little bit about how people do diagnose and, and how that's not, you know, it could be a multiple things um, and it, including kind of highly stressed burnout. Is it common that a big misdiagnosis or wrong label is attached? Um, I mean, I can it's I'll be honest with you, that's quite a difficult question to answer purely because it's the sort of thing where if you gave a, a scenario, we could tell you what happened in that case. But the reality is, yes, there are occasions where things are misdiagnosed. However, if you look at Claire's uh, case study, for example, the person was given a diagnosis of dyslexia and then it was only later on in life they went, oh, you do have dyslexia but you also do have dyspraxia. And it's very common, particularly with these, uh, the conditions that fall under the neurodiversity umbrella, for there to be multiple uh, mm. diagnoses with one, but one is uh, more forward presenting. So one is, I mean, for want of a better phrase, more obvious. Um, I would say that with the specific traits, I don't imagine that someone would be diagnosed with a um, a neurodiverse condition when it was stress because while some of the symptoms shall we say could be present in both the traits aren't necessarily there in in both and stress excluding um chronic stress or prolonged stress does tend to be in sort of bouts and up and downs whereas these conditions are lifelong conditions that are are always present um and also with the actual diagnosis and the question is if you like you find that a lot of the questions asked are based on the person's childhood and their history which aren't necessarily things that would come into a conversation about stress burnout rust out and um, so it's 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 a lot a much longer process uh, for these sort of diagnosis for for neurodiversity conditions um has anyone else got anything that they'd say on that again i just want to reiterate that diagnosis may be helpful for some people it may unlock um the protection of the equality act um it's not necessarily a requirement for good employers to put support into place so again i would maybe focus on the challenge that that, that person is experiencing and trying to resolve those to alleviate potential causes of stress because then you might, might be able to see a difference between what is their normal traits and what is an experience of their current stressful situation so I would say focus on the the presentation in the workplace and and resolve the workplace issues as best you can 
um, because that's things that you can control. Whereas the journey to a diagnosis, the length of time it takes and the cost that it takes is is a, is a bigger picture. Actually, what you can do for that, that person is to work with them now about what's the challenges that they're experiencing. So again, just some of the things that we've highlighted could be things that they're experiencing. Some of the adjustments we could, could be helpful. Try try a bit of trial and error to see how you can actually resolve those workplace um, situations for people could be really helpful in the, in the interim. A diagnosis is not the be all and end all for everybody. Uh, it might be really important to that person, but it may also not be important. It may be quite a traumatic process. So it, it isn't always um, the solution. Thank you. Um, that actually covers quite a few other questions that have come through a little bit about ADHD, where some people have said that some of these, um, the challenges and strengths overlap with ADHD. And I think, Alice, what you said is it can be that kind of multi-factor. So yeah, thank I you. ADHD in particular is an interesting one, just because of the, the length of time that it takes for someone um, occasionally to get a diagnosis for ADHD. And the the sort of the treatment, if you like, for ADHD is different depending on the person. Occasionally medications on the table. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's therapy and, and coping strategies. Um, and people with ADHD, you know, you might not get a diagnosis. Like my aunt, she's in her, uh, nearly in her 60s and has just had a diagnosis of ADHD. And for her, wonderful, um, because she spent her entire life thinking that there was something wrong or that she was a bad person and turns out ADHD who knew um but there are others where you know having that piece of paper if you like doesn't really make a significant difference to who they are as a person the the, the barriers and the challenges are, are the same brilliant okay thank you um Claire Johnson has asked about some of the um workplace adjustments that you've mentioned are a little bit easier to maybe implement in an office environment have we got any advice compared to kind of ma a factory floor or manufacturing or would you say that some of those could be across the board um I, I mean I think we can all answer this to an extent I think you know the, the ones that we were suggesting there they're commonplace for barriers so we were looking at the barriers and then the things that we can do to to challenge or remove those barriers, but there are things that can be done in completely different environments, but it's gonna depend entirely on the person and also the phrase reasonable adjustment, because mm. I say, you know, you know quite quieter, quieter environment, noise canceling headphones, that might not be, that might be a health and safety risk in certain environments, mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily gonna be possible, but that's one of the benefits of having these workplace assessments, because we can think, right, well, this is your specific workplace. These are your policies. This is the health and safety uh, rules and regs. What can we do to abide by what's reasonable for you and the employee in question? Back you up yep. there, Alice. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, it, and that... our role is to look at um, what's reasonable and yeah. be incorporated from the um, employer's um, perspective as well as the employee's perspective and i'll just go back to those final five questions is that we've given generic lists if you like of adjustments most people are going to need a handful of those across all of those slides that alice wonderfully delivered so actually doing those five questions actually identifies what's important to that person um and how is it affecting them in their day-to-day -day job um and the expert in what their challenges are is the person that you're sat opposite and then usually a line manager will be the person holding the conversation who has the overall picture of kind of the workplace and what would work and how it might impact the rest of the team and and what's possible within the working environment and it's having those two people in a really productive conversation um so whether it is you need a workplace just a workplace assessment to support that whether the the toolkit which comes out from a self-help point of view and an eye manager point of view helps that conversation but it is that conversation that is the key um and is a understanding the person's the impact that it's having on somebody at work is the key to unlocking those adjustments thank you um, somebody's just come back actually Claire on on the bit that you mentioned about interim funding well a few people have mm -hmm. come back would you with what you discussed about interim funding would you conduct a workplace assessment beforehand yes uh, yeah. once we, the uh, 
access to work application has been made yes yeah so um we work quite closely with access to work and they accept our reports so they won't then carry out another assessment and send in an external um provider of the assessments um so we produce that um recommend that they initiate their application and then we approach the employer with that list of adjustments and anything that needs to be funded we say will you be happy to fund this with the risk that it may not be covered when the funding comes through. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Claire. Um, that's answered quite a few people's questions, actually. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, again, are there any typical recommendations that you would encourage employers to adopt during a job interview or application process? Is there anything along these lines that you might say up front? Oh, Kath, getting excited. She wants yeah, to. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so go for, for it, Kath. As part of the disability confident support that I offer to businesses, this is one of the key things. So disability confident as a standard focuses a lot on attraction and recruitment. So it's a topic mm. I've covered in, a lot of times. But um, for me, it's around the language that you use, um, whether your website is accessible, uh, whether you have alternative routes of application, whether you can make adjustments to the length of time people have for assessments, um, whether you have the guaranteed interview scheme if somebody ticks the box that they have a disability, um, whether you ask somebody if they need adjustments to the recruitment process, um, offering additional time in interviews, um, looking at making adjustments or even skipping parts of assessment days or group activities or interviews. Um, the list goes on and on. But uh, for me, the key things is making sure that you are a receptive employer on the external perception of your business will attract people to apply. So you're attracting the talent in the first place. Ask up front and offer an opportunity for people to contact you to ask for adjustments. And they will often tell you what adjustments they need. So you don't necessarily need to be an expert in everything because the person will usually say, I need a word copy of this application form because my assistive technology doesn't work with your online application. So actually the two main things is present yourself as a, an inclusive employer from the start and offer them the opportunity for ask for adjustments, have the conversation. Again, the person is often the expert, so you don't have to be. Great. Thank you, Kath. Um, another common theme is uh, around the EA 2010. It, are, as diagnosis can take quite a, a long time, are the employees protected under this whilst the diagnosis is ongoing or is it just when they get a diagnosis? Okay, so before we go into the answer that question, I guess my comment is, why do we only put adjustments into place when the law tells us to? Um, we've seen in the, the session, we focus a lot on skills and strengths. And for me, mm. uh, any good employer should see that those skills and strengths are worth investing in. And the investment is putting the support in to allow somebody to show their true skills and unleash their potential. So I don't even want us to be thinking about the Equality Act. And uh, the only time the Equality Act comes up is when there's a problem. So when that when the employer hasn't, um, supported their employee for the moral and ethical and business reasons that we know exist. That's when the equality captain. So I, I'm, I, I think it's a, it's a safety net to fall back on for some people when they aren't, when they are treated unfairly. But my recommendation is that if you are a manager or an employer, don't do it because you legally have to do it because why would you not want these skills in your business? Why would you not want this talent to flourish? So make the adjustments, whether the act tells you to or not. Um, so that's that's where I come from on that perspective. No, thank you, mm -hmm. Kath. Um, some just some general great feedback as well, and a few people have said that they love the fact that the key takeaway for them is the, that the person is the expert, so you don't have, we don't have to be. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, there's a somebody's come through as well. We have an amb we are an ambulance service, and we've got an employee that's got dyspraxia who is undergoing training to become a paramedic. They just they struggle to remember instructions and making the quick response required in an emergency situation. They're looking for advice on how to manage this, and maybe want to take offline. Yeah, so I would say one one of the things we said around um, adapting training methods. So quite often, mm. um, education in general is quite difficult for somebody who's dyspraxic or dyslexic because the traditional methods of teaching and training do not reflect their different learning styles. So I would have a look at the methods that you're using and actually are you using a variety of learning styles? 
you know, are you offering the opportunity to learn by experience, to do demonstration and observation, as well as reading material, traditional lecture style. So I would have a look at the way that you're passing the information on and actually finding out how that person learns best because they will be able to learn. It's just we haven't perhaps found the right methodology to suit the way that their brain works. So it's kind of trying trying a few different methods and maybe trying to investigate their preferred learning styles. Mm -hmm. um, somebody's asked, what can I do if the company I work for needs me to actually be assessed for dyslexia before they help? So if, sort of from an individual perspective. <laughs> if I feel that um, for us to engage with um, an individual, we don't need that diagnosis. Um, and there are still some employers that do want that diagnosis. Um, it, it's a it's a really difficult one um, in terms of. I, I would say engage with um, a workplace adjustment program, some sort of service that can manage that whole situation um, and, and help support you getting the um, support that you need. Okay. I mean, one, one downside is, is obviously, even if you've, you are able to process that for, get for go for a diagnosis, that you're still going to need that support during the, uh, leading up to and following that. So, actually it would be useful to start some sort of process of some small adjustments in place to support you in the workplace so that you are not left floundering while waiting for that diagnosis mm -hmm. um because you know though obviously there is a wait there could be a waiting list there's also the cost of that um that diagnosis that that needs to be borne somewhere as well so again um certainly self-help wise as well if you can learn anything from this session which gives you an idea about how maybe you could do things differently for yourself taking a bit of control um because a lot of those things that Alice talked about doesn't require your manager to pay for anything mm -hmm. um it could just be the way that you do things and again it could be working with your line manager and your team just to make some very small changes in the interim could actually start to to help you feel more comfortable about the the, the support that you're going to get longer term just about around the costs um access to it don't cover any diagnostic assessment costs so um, it would have to be borne by the individual or their employer. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Thank you, Claire. Um, I, that actually brings us now to the end of, of the session. We have still got quite a lot of unanswered questions, so I think we perhaps will collate uh, an FAQ document. I'll work with the panellists to collate that. That will probably be over the next week or so. Uh, but as I say, in the meantime, what we'll do is send out a link to the recording tomorrow We'll also send out a link to a brochure of all of the sort of services and the toolkits, et cetera, and where, where you've popped your email address and, and want some further information, a colleague of ours will follow up with you directly as well. But I would just like to say a huge thank you to, to the panellists. That was such an informative. Uh, we've had lots of lovely feedback as well. People saying it was really interesting and uh, also lots of stuff that they can take directly back into the workplace, which is what we always want to give our um attendees which is fantastic so massive thank you for that and also a huge thank you to our audience thank you so much for tuning in um and we'll we'll be in touch shortly have a lovely day <laughs>